become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Tim Miller, the writer at large for The Bulwark and a political analyst for MSNBC. I'm excited to be here with you all today, and I am honored to be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a friend of mine, an American hero, who's here to discuss his new book, Here Right Matters, an American Story. I'm sure you all know Alex, but uh, after former President Trump's infamous phone call to Ukraine's President Zelensky, he felt duty bound to report up the chain of command. The president had extorted a foreign ally to damage a political challenger at home. And here, right matters. Vindman is telling his story for the first time about how he ended up at the center of this firestorm. We're going to be discussing that and more in the next hour. I also want to hear your questions. So if you're watching along with us, please put them in the text chat on YouTube and we'll be getting to them later in the program. I also have a question from Alex's wife that I'll be getting to at the end of the program, which I'm very excited about. Sir, thank you so much. How's the book tour been going? What is, how's the response been? And um, what has been your biggest takeaway from, from all of this? Sure. Thanks, Tim. Uh, first of all, I need to figure out who that musical score was by. I think it was John Williams. It's quite the introdu uh, introduction. I, I need to get some of that in the future. Uh, uh, but um, it's been going pretty well. I mean, this is a very, very sharp learning curve on something that I really, frankly, never thought I'd, I'd be doing. Uh, I thought eventually I'd probably do something on policy or on uh, you know, on geopolitics, I'm working on my dissertation at Hopkins. So that that project is already in the works. But as a kind of somebody in their mid 40s writing a memoir, it's, it's a little bit surreal. And uh, as a new brand new author, which I could add, add, add to my job description, it's it's been interesting to understand how the business works. Uh, in in terms of takeaways, you know, the, I, I'm super, super grateful for the just the, the fantastic reviews I've gotten from uh, you know, handful of people that have read the thing. Uh, Me, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the uh, the three or four of you guys, uh, folks, John, uh, Nancy out there, and uh, Paul. I appreciate you uh, you picking up the book. Maybe we've done a little bit better than that, but still, uh, I'm, we're up against the machine uh, of the Republican Party that literally buys like tens of thousands of books and hands them out to like the the, the uh, book burning conventions uh to to raise funds and stuff like that uh it's it's kind of a little bit tough to to see behind the curtain and understand how it works a little bit well i think you're being humble uh, i think you're doing pretty well i i wish that we could all be here together um if it wasn't uh you know maybe for some of that misinformation that is out there that is uh, you know driving the the rise of covid uh, we are here in california at the california commonwealth club alex is in la and i'm up in oakland uh, we wanted to be together in San Francisco, but such is life. We hope to see you all next year. Um, for, for the folks who haven't read, uh, you know, haven't had the chance to read the book, obviously it just came out, or who don't know your full story, I, I wanted to start uh, really quick about your personal journey, uh, which I think is really central to this story. And it's called Here Right Matters, an American story for a reason. And I, and I believe that that your journey from uh, from Ukraine uh, to America as a young child is, is really instructive as to kind of how you ended up here and in the center of this drama. So uh, tell people a little bit about your, your childhood and, um, and, and how it was you ended up in America in the first place. Sure. This is another surreal uh, aspect of, of uh, writing a, a memoir is that people are like, hey, how is your, you know, are you, are you limping? How is your ankle? You know, I know you heard it before Rangers or like uh, in Ranger school or all sorts of like intimate details about, about my background that I shouldn't be shocked about anymore. Cause I wrote a gosh darn book about it, but it's still like, it's still odd that people, you know, all sorts of background about me. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty awesome, uh, you know, if I take a step back and take myself out of this, 
the 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 fact that I'm you know in front of the the camera now it's a pretty awesome story about a humble backgrounds which I think is is shared by you know swathes of Americans uh, swathes of uh, American immigrants coming here and kind of rebuilding uh, from scratch. I came here as a as a as a you know toddler. My dad started um, my dad restarted his life at forty seven. So his was even more kind of a uh, a strange juxtapos juxtaposition of uh, pr prosperity, seeming prosperity in the Soviet Union, and then starting from zero back in the United States, all to to provide a better future for his children. So it's, um, it's a story about those kind of humble origins uh, coming to the United States, growing up in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, not kind of the, the cool Brooklyn of nowadays, the trendy, you know, gentrified Brooklyn. But Where I go to the of, bar when I come to town, not that yeah, part of Brooklyn. Not yeah, no, no, this is the kind of the, the rough and tumble. I, I watched this, this show called The Warriors, which was pretty awesome. It was filmed in 79. I, I always loved it as a kid. I just watched it after like probably a couple of decades. And it shows this, this odyssey of a, a gang going to like a gang uh, um, retreat of sorts in the Bronx and then having to work their way up back down to Brooklyn, Coney Island, which is where we, we settled for right in that Brighton Beach, Coney Island there for a year and a half. It was something closer than that than to what it is nowadays, Brooklyn. But it, it's that, um, you know, being a bit of a, I don't know if I would just say quite a hooligan, but uh, uh, maybe not entirely focused when I was a uh, young guy um, and um, a rascal, I guess, of sorts, getting into fights, military service and what I, I gained from military service, which was uh, an enormous amount. Um, I am pretty, pretty blessed to have the career I had and then really to contribute to U.S. national security in a huge way by defending the Constitution against uh, domestic enemies. Yeah, well, I, I want to get to that. You, you, you breezed over your dad, and I, and I, when I was reading the story, it was the thing that struck me the most about about it, about his life. And you just said he's forty seven. You know, he had a you had a stable life. Your mother had passed away of cancer. Um, you were living in in Ukraine, right? Um, and he had a successful career as an engineer um, there. Was in his mid forties and decided for the benefit of your family um, uh, because of what he saw as the problems of the so Soviets and the Soviet regime to pick up, move you guys to America uh, with his mother-in-law and, and start a job doing basically manual labor. Uh, I mean, what, what did you think that, what did you learn from that choice from him? And, and also uh, what did it say to you about this country that you were coming to, that your dad would, would make such a drastic move? Yeah. Well, I think uh, in part, it was a, a definitely a deep understanding that uh, there are endless possibilities in America, uh, both then and now, frankly, which is something we lose sight of. We were so uh, focused kind of on the on the inflamed grievances that uh, you know, media right and left, frankly, but certainly by far the right wing media kind of uh, um, rouses us with that we forget to really take a look around at our at our lives or our neighborhoods. And we're doing pretty well, especially if we put that in contrast to the difficulties and challenges that are uh, that other people on this on this planet face. So I think he had an, an intuitive understanding of that. He understood that, you know, uh, before my mother passed away, that medical care would be uh, that she could potentially be saved or would be able to live longer, which is one of the kind of the 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 seeds for his idea to potentially come to the United States, the anti-Semitism uh, that would limit his children's possibilities there. Uh, he had high hopes that would be the case here. And he was willing to frankly risk, risk it all on kind of uh, on these, on these hopes and beliefs, something that that's, he certainly passed on to, to my, me and uh, my generation with my brothers and something that I'm passing on to my daughter uh, very hopeful, sunny, happy, resilient. Uh, and that's kind of a, a part of his legacy, I think. Yeah. I mean, in the Catholic church, we always call it the zeal of the convert. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes us cradle Catholics don't have the same passion yeah. um, as, as someone who had, who had converted. And I just felt that throughout your, this entire book, right. And that, and through your testimony, right. That, that your belief and faith in this country was based in that faith that your dad had as a, as somebody who you know, basically converted, if you will, to, to American, to, to Americanism. Well, I think it's that uh, he had a, 
he had a, a breadth of experience with his 47 years in the Soviet Union. And in certain ways, I followed um, followed some of that with my my experiences being uh, uh, posted all along all around the world and in Korea along the, the border between North and South Korea um, in a combat zone in Iraq in Ukraine in Moscow in, in Germany which was not not a tough assignment but just having had this breadth of experience and understood the unique opportunities I think that's frankly something that the military shares and that's why one of the reasons besides the, the fact that they join because they're patriots and they want to volunteer it, it uh, the service is, it, itself, in these uh, assignments overseas just basically reinforces the uniqueness of America and the opportunities that Americans have uh, and puts things a little bit in perspective. And it really kind of makes, you know, ardent uh, patriots even more ardent, uh, the zeal that you referred to. So talk, talk about that. I know that, um, you know, I've been listening to some of your other interviews and and this kind of discussion of the Purple Heart is is sometimes you know, one that obviously brings a lot of pride, but also, you know, kind of complicated feelings for, for veterans who've been awarded the Purple Heart as you were. But I, I just talk about that. You choose then, you know, you, you grow up as this immigrant rough, roughneck. I'm, I'm calling you a roughneck. I don't know if you called yourself that, but I'm going to call you a roughneck in, in, uh, in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. And, um, and, and, you know, you come to American University, don't graduate. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reveal that secret that's in the book. I'm not embarrassing you. I'm not embarrassing you. You did it on the second try. I did it on the first try. No big deal. But, um, uh, you did it on the second try and, and, you know, why, what is it that makes you say, you know, I am going to put myself on the line for this country that was not even the country of my birth and say, I'm going to go volunteer. And, and you ended up in some, in a very, some very hinky, you know, situations in Iraq, just sort of talk about the decision to get in and then, you know, what you learned there in, in Fallujah, um, uh, you know, when your, when your life was really on the line for this country. You know, I don't have, I don't think, I, I don't have an answer that quite even satisfies myself as to why. I know that there is a, there is definitely a, a common uh, interest between my, all my brothers and, and I to serve I think it's a combination of uh, wanting to do something to uh, return the favor to the to the United States, our, our, our home that welcomed us, not the one that we were born in. But I think there's also a recognition of um, the fact that it just was a good way to channel our um, lack of focus and add, uh, you know, give us a little bit of focus and discipline growing up. I think it served all of my brothers quite well. So it was a mutually beneficial uh, situation, a win-win uh, for, for, I thought, that for, for the country and for us to be able to serve. And then, um, you know, in terms of service in, in, in combat, I, I started out as an infantryman. Uh, and there is a strange, maybe morbid sense of uh, testing yourself uh, um, in, under the most adverse uh, conditions. And this nation went to war. Uh, right or wrong at the time, you know, the, the thought was that it was under threat from, from uh, you know, from an adversary. And um, I, there was an urgency to both test myself and contribute to national security by serving overseas. I don't think, you know, uh, many officers, especially at that level, uh, as, a, as a young captain, really kind of reflect on the deeper issues. Uh, at the time, uh, 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 we, we were more concerned about kind of learning our craft, um, managing our organizations to uh, survive those, those perils. And um, what I've learned from my time in, in combat is that uh, I'm trainable, uh, I, I, which is, you know, it's a good thing to, to learn about yourself is that you, you're trainable and you actually could uh, learn to react to, uh, react to contact, react, react to ambush and, uh, you know, remain uh, cool, calm, collected, and respond the way you're supposed to uh, to 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 um, achieve tactical uh, victories and things of that nature. Um, I, I learned that I was a very very quick study, frankly, in a lot of ways. Even though uh, maybe my ac my earlier academic um, disinclination didn't suggest that, but if I'm focused and I, uh, I apply myself to something, I could. Right now, this is a very very sharp learning curve. Talking about a book. And yeah. I could see that, like that, you know, I'm still maybe at best halfway up this hill, but it's been a steep ascent. And uh, I, 
I kind of, I guess, pride myself on, on you know, uh, being able to um, meet this sharp learning curve and, and uh, you know, not be overcome by apprehension, anxiety, and things of that nature. So I learned a, a bunch of different things, I think, about myself. Again, with the humility, which I appreciate, but um, I was, we're fast forwarding to what I wanted to get to at the end, but I just, I have to ask this now because just listen to you talk about this, it gets my blood pressure up and it gets me pissed. How did, like, how did it feel, you know, we'll get back into how this all happened, but how did it feel when you were getting just assaulted and your manhood getting a challenge by, you know, keyboard warriors like me, you know, who, who have no blisters on their hands, like after you know, after what you had put on the line for this country, that had to kind of surprise you, right? That that you you are you're in Fallujah, you you are serving in a very dangerous as an infantryman in a very dangerous situation for this country. You have shrapnel in your body as a result of this. Uh, you're you know the when that IED goes off and um, uh, when you're in, in Fallujah, obviously this is a life or death situation, and, and you know years later, you know a decade later. Here you are, you know, having to listen to, you know, these pajama conservative pajama boy podcasters telling you that, you know, you're a cuckold. Like, well, like, like that has to just drive you mad. Tim, don't be so hard on the conservatives. Why are you bashing the conservatives so hard? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not. I, there are some really great I, principled I, conservatives I like I'm, yourself. I'm, I'm but, but there were a lot of pajama boys out there yeah, trying joking. to attack you. Uh, you, you. My initial response is something as whimsical as like a laughing face uh, emoji in response because you can't really take them seriously. I mean, honestly, you know uh, what 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 I what is meaningful to me are my friends my family, uh, my professional network and the support they offer, the encouragement they offer. And some, some clown, you know, uh, over the airwaves or on, um, on social media attacking me. I'm like, you have to maintain some perspective about these things. Like I, I, it's a source of entertainment to sometimes look at the, the, that kind of nonsensical uh, criticism. I'm like, okay, I wish some of these people would try to say something like this to my face. <laughs> but nobody has so far. Nobody has actually done that. Uh, I, I've just had, felt a lot of uh, uh, warmth and, and love from people. Uh, it's just the loud, obnoxious voices sometimes that, that get the most play. Um, and, you know, we, certainly we, we received threats and things of that nature, um, both to the home and uh, over, over social media. But uh, and I, I'm mindful of it. I've received uh, uh, training on how to uh, kind of identify threats and 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 um, understand kind of the, the force protection environment and uh, keep my family safe. So I'm, I'm alert to these, these things, but I really don't take most of it seriously. I think they're, they're a bunch of clowns, um, you know, weekend warriors, uh, folks that not, and this is not a dig on like, you know, uh, what, what sometimes uh, National Guard gets described on. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about guys that get, get dressed up in camouflage and get all these like cool looking weapons, but can't shoot them straight. And, uh, you know, don't know which end is the, the, the danger end and so forth. I mean, it's really hard to, to kind of take folks like that seriously. I'm glad you can get some amusement from it. I just hope you get some solace knowing that it fills, filled me with rage every day having to look at it. Um, so someone, someone had to channel the rage so you could have the, uh, um, so you can have the laughs, I think. Um, I, I want to get to the on that, part on of- that, On that note though, I'll tell you in hindsight, and I missed the window because I was still in uniform, but I did write an article for Lawfare at, point, at one point, and it really enraged the, the kind of the, the far right, like loud mouse, because I said, basically what you need to do with these folks is you need to litigate, you need to sue them, you hit, hit them in the pocketbooks, and they, they won't be so kind of mouthy anymore because they've paid a cost for it. It's not kind of one of those anonymous attacks or, you know, uh, something with no cost. So I, I would encourage that in general, like we need to Let's let's go ahead and apply our, our energies to putting together a fund to kind of, you know, to sue some of these folks and get them to shut up and stop being so obnoxious. That's right. Sounds like Dominion Voting Systems is doing pretty good on that front, actually. So uh, we need more folks like that. Um, I, I want to get to the reason why this book happened, the, the infamous phone call. But but just before that, I kind of want you to paint this picture because we haven't talked about your twin brother. Who you're very close with um, you. Do you call him Yug? Is that what you use? You uh, you, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I won't try to say it. We'll just call him Twin Alex. Like you, um, you, Eugene, but without the rest of the Ean. Huge, <laughs> huge. Um, uh, so you're. I, I, what? 
what did it feel like? And I'm just reading the book and I just, I didn't feel like I got the satisfactory answer. You get, you get brought into the White House by Fiona Hill mm -hmm. and, and, and you're working in the White House with, you're down the hall is your twin brother. Uh, yes. you, you guys are getting in these fights in little Odessa who are immigrants from, you know, your dad is a working class family. I, and that just had to blow your mind to think that when in the halls of the White House um, uh, was both you and your twin brother at the same time in service to this country. I, I mean, that the first day you walked in, it just had to really be a moment. No. Well, I mean, that's definitely true. We, we were, I mean, I think it, the first day and the last day, frankly, uh, I, I was always awestruck walking through those hallowed halls um, where so much was on the line on a daily basis, where you had really the 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 best uh, and, and the brightest looking to do good for this nation. And I was just, um, I was I, I was in awe of, of walking those halls that so many uh, brilliant people had walked before me and uh, that were serving with me. Uh, at the professional level and at the political level, because um, as we as we both know, uh, most of the Trump administration were were like you know third tier uh, uh, picks. Certainly, as you got later on into the administration, but the professionals, the folks coming out of departments and agencies were were amazing. And Eugene and I being there together, the Vinman twins, uh, you know the NSC the NSC twins is what we were known as. We were the only two twins to serve on the NSC. Maybe the last ones too, for that matter. <laughs> it's that the uh, Ghostbusters. First and last. Yeah, first and last, the Ghostbusters. You, we crossed the streams with the two of us being there. And, you know, the whole, th there was a, a, a almost total annihilation of the White House. Um, but um, it was pretty amazing. And it was humbling. Um, I don't know. I just get chills just thinking about it. I had to walk in there and think, holy, holy cow. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss at the Commonwealth Club, but holy cow, like that, that we both we both made it here here at the same time. So your first day, I want you to talk, though, also about the first the first day on the job um, at the NSC. Something yes, kind yes. of interesting happened. Um, tell Very us about much. that. Yeah, I, I just walked in there, did the standard uh, human resources and processing, you know, like uh, uh, the media policies here's your computer password. And then I took a break to turn on the, the, the uh, you know, the newsfeed in my office and uh, listen in on the, uh, on President Trump's uh, um, summit. Um, you know, um, what are they, what are these things called again? At the end, the press conferences, there we yep. go. The press conference at the end of the summit with, uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin. And it may, it kind of derailed my day, frankly. I didn't really get all my in-processing done because it was crisis management and it was a kind of a uh, dispelled some of my uh, thoughts about the fact that this, you know, I could navigate this uh, and um, contribute to, to national security, you know, with maybe minimal hand grenades and minimal um, craziness. Uh, I, I thought, uh, or I had hoped that would be the case. And my first day kind of quickly dispelled that notion. Now, the magic of that moment with you uh, just dissipated pretty quickly, it seems like. Um, I, so your your job at the NSC, uh, just for context for folks, uh, was was overseeing security policy related to Russia and and Eastern Eastern Europe. And so you get in that day and it and it's day one and, and the, the Helsinki press conference is happening. You, you write in the book that, that someone advised you that you were coming into the most dangerous and challenging environment you've ever been in, uh, including Fallujah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I guess my, my biggest question is like, why, why did you do, why did you do it? Like, I, I didn't, I, I, aren't you thinking to yourself, I, I just, I, I don't know if this is the right, right for me to put myself in this situation where I'm in charge of security policy in such a fraught situation with this president. It's, it's, you know, the, you could sense the awe I had for, for the, the office and for the, the mission and I think there were a couple of different things, frankly. It's one of those jobs you just simply can't refuse. I mean, even to your own peril. It's one of those things where, you know, if you think that you could contribute to the mission, and I had some hopes of kind of, you know, a, Bro a Brooklyn guy talking to a Queens guy, you know, writing memos that could resonate with the president. I could talk his language and say, well, this is why I, everything is transactional with the president, but this is why, you know, this transaction makes sense. And uh, in addition to that, there was frankly an element of hubris, and as, as indicated by, by, by belief that I could kind of reach the guy. <laughs> but um, 
you know, that, that things could be different. And I also wanted to really, uh, I mean, this is a position that I'd kind of sought for, for a while. I remember having a conversation with Michael McFall, uh, the ambassador to, uh, he was senior director for European affairs. So Fiona's Hill, uh, Hill's predecessor, but he was also the ambassador to Moscow uh, for um, while I was while I was serving in uh, in um, Russia, and was sitting in Spaso House having a conversation about, and I kind of you know soft pitched the idea of like what about serving on the National Security Council? And I was like, you should definitely do it. He encouraged me. I was like, okay, well, how do I? And then I started thinking about how to get there. I was fortunate to serve in an awesome position. Um, at the Pentagon as the, uh, as the Poland Mill Affairs Officer, Political Military Affairs Officer for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So I was the belly button for, for the military on how we face you know, the challenge of a, a resurgent aggressive Russia. I authored the, the kind of the, the definitive document on how to do this. And that's how I came to the attention of Fiona Hill. So I thought I, you know, I'd kind of earned the, 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 the right to, to be competitive, to be considered and when I went in for my interview, uh, Fiona kind of hired me on the spot. She'd already seen me in action. And she's like, uh, she, I was talking to her deputy, uh, this awesome, um, you know, four-time uh, ser uh, uh, um, servant in the White House on the National Security Council, a retired Army Colonel, Rich Hooker. He, uh, he was the one that kind of did the bulk of the interview because she was tied up in meetings. And she kind of came into the office uh, she like kind of glanced over at him. He kind of gave a little head nod and she's like, okay, when can you join? I was like, okay, awesome. Uh, so, <laughs> so I have to ask you this, um, as the, as the preeminent Russia security expert, as somebody who's day one on the security council was there, uh, at the day of Helsinki, what the heck do you think happened when Trump and Putin were talking? Obviously you can't break any, any, you know, security clearance stuff, but just as gen generally speaking, like what, like what is happening in those conversations? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting. I have frankly a little bit less, con I, I've got less concern than, than the general public. First of all, you know, the, the, uh, at one point, the interpreter at the s center of the storm that was in the right. room on this conversation, somebody I knew and actually had traveled. I, I, before, uh, less than, you know, I guess two months before, probably about six weeks before, she was my translator when when we were taking the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs to meet with his Russian counterpart. So I knew that, you know, she was an, another uh, kind of Russian immigrant uh, patriot. She wouldn't do something that, you know, was, was going to be, if there was something illegal or unlawful, she wouldn't be kind of a party to that. So there was that that component that, you know, put things a little bit at ease. And, and second of all, I also understand that, <clears throat> Putin is a pretty savvy, savvy operator. He's a case officer. That's how it was his time in the KGB. And he didn't really need to apply all, a lot of tools uh, on, uh, on uh, the tool Trump. You're saying uh, Trump was an easy mark. He's, he was an easy mark. He was a uh, useful idiot. It would be the term of art in, in, the, uh, in the kind of uh, the human community. Um, he was somebody that you know, aspired to be an uh, authoritarian, had, uh, had those tendencies really admired authoritarians and uh you know uh, was looking to kind of ingratiate himself to a certain extent with um with putin and uh, being an easy mark he was the, another of uh, an army term free chicken and i use this one on on uh, uh for an interview one time because he again he easy mark he didn't have to uh, putin didn't have to work for it so i think he you know he was manipulated in certain ways um but in ways that were useful to trump himself who was uh not a successful businessman. Let's not let's let's not buy in that into that thing based on his failed business. He has his reputation in, in New York. There should be a rule. If you can't even get uh, uh, you can't win a majority in your own locality, you should be disqualified for running for kind of higher office because nobody in New York would vote for him because everybody understood who he was. He was a kind of a used car salesman. But because of uh, uh, he's, he's he's kind of savvy in at least you know, trying to, to work with people and be in charming on small, uh, on a small level. Um, he, I think, I think Trump saw some utility in buying into Putin's line that Russia wasn't involved in interference in 2016 election, because that would itself, if it, if he, if Russia was, then Trump didn't earn it and it cast a shadow over his, his administration. So it was easy for, for Trump to kind of just, you know, take that line hook line and sinker and 
you know, I don't think it was particularly savvy to criticize the the uh, the federal government on its operations, but that's where he went with it. Sure. So fast forward to the to the Zelensky call, the infamous Zelensky call. Uh, you're sitting there. Just paint the picture for everyone. You're sitting there in the room. What what happens? And then why why did you make the decision that you did? Uh, which I think is the fundamental question of of the book and what leads yeah. you to here right now. It was it was there was really like almost I'm going to work backwards and say there was really no no decision to be made. It was just simply the right thing to do. I, I knew it viscerally that this was my my job to report this and to have people advise the president to reverse course, because what he was looking to do was immoral, unethical and probably criminal uh, if it wasn't for the fact that the president had presidential immunity. Um, so. That decision was relatively easy. I mean, I'd sworn an oath to defend, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I thought that the U.S. was under threat, and there was really no length that I was willing to not go to 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 defend to live up to my obligations. So that that's that part was easy. But what what brought me to that phone call is you know the fact that I'd work been working on this portfolio and watching a slow moving train wreck unfold uh, with. The president seeking uh, a, a, what ended up being a continuing enterprise to tip the scales in his favor, to um, upend you know a, a, an election process, and to ultimately try to steal an election. I was at the leading edge of this. Giuliani played a hand in kind of eliminating the obstacles, getting um, Masha Ivanovich fired. Uh, you know that spawn of uh, of, of Trump, Donald uh, Don Jr. You know, weighed in and and ultimately was what, who he's the person that got Masha Ivanovich fired because her position became untenable once he tweeted about her, and then seeing this unfold into a hold on security assistance, seeing this unfold into a pressure campaign to get the Ukrainians to, you know, to give up the goods. These are this is doesn't this is the similar similar to what was announced recently where the president was all I need is simple announcement of an um, investigation and I'll take it from there. That's all he was looking for, and um. And watching, you know, folks first from outside of government, but then folks inside of government, uh, uh, Gordon Sondland and Mick Mulvaney uh, be drawn into this enterprise and thinking that, you know, maybe it's just do-gooders, folks that want to ingratiate themselves with the president, you know, doing the uh, doing doing a bidding of sorts for him, and then watching it culminate with the president actually being the driving force. So that's so just, uh, that's, so that's interesting. Just on that context, really quick. So do you? So you're you sort of had watched this what you call the slow motion train wreck can happen. So when the president asks Zelensky for the favor, you know, of looking into CrowdStrike and you know looking into Hunter Biden, is that bad? Do, do you think that that background, you know, knowing what was going on with Rudy and and you know all those other uh, Goombas, um, help you? Uh, you know, was that? essential to determining that this was something they had to report you know, Absolutely. Or, or was it was it just the, the president did regardless was was it was reportable no it was i think uh the, what the president did regardless was reportable but i had the context to understand what was going on tim uh tim morrison had just joined the team and although he was briefed pretty darn well by fiona about what was going on with this with this slow motion train wreck he really could, quite, couldn't quite grasp like the kind of the, the nuance there uh, he, he, this was in his area of expertise. He's an arms control guy. He had, frankly, had no business being in in that European portfolio, uh, senior as a senior director. So, but I could tell that he was he he you know, afterwards when we were going through the press release, he was like, okay, this didn't we didn't talk about this in his dry kind of way. We didn't talk about this. So we could only we could say uh, there was a congratulatory phone call or something like that. Yeah. Um, so he didn't miss it. The other people that were less you know privy to the to the to what was going on. Uh, and less uh, less understanding, you know, even understood less. And I knew that uh, as the director for European affairs, Ukraine in my portfolio, it was my responsibility. You know, frankly, if I didn't say anything, uh, the president's wrongdoing, uh, abuse of power would would not have been uncovered. And in a way, th- uh, the president would the, the president wouldn't simply put if I didn't make uh, my complaint, the president wouldn't probably have not been impeached the first time. Yeah, uh, and. Um, you know, that was the beginning of the enterprise. It continued on through, uh, you know, a mismanagement of COVID because he wasn't held accountable by Republican leadership. It you know, continued on through uh, suppressing peaceful protests. It continued on through trying to steal an election. 
at every point he was getting signals that he could do whatever he wants without accountability uh, from from the re Republican establishment, uh, unfortunately. This this leads to something that I've been wondering. Um, you know, you say that it, had you not reported, it, he wouldn't have been impeached at all. I 100 percent agree that that's that's the case. Why are why weren't there more Vindens? Uh, you know, I mean, Olivia Troy, obviously, and Elizabeth Newman spoke out about the co uh, Olivia Troy in particular on the covid um, uh, task force, um, which I thought was really brave. But I, I don't I, you know, maybe this is just me you know, being too conspiratorial or whatever. But it seems like that there was a, the Ukraine deal was replicated in Turkey and in Saudi Arabia and in other places. Um, like, may, you know, why weren't there more examples of this over the course of the four of the four years? And do you think that there were other actions like this that just didn't go reported? It, no, it seems unlikely this was the only one. No, no it's, uh, that's absolutely true. And that's why, you know, one of the things I talk about now is, accountability and uh, close examination of wrongdoing so we could learn from from uh, um, from abuse of power and potentially kind of harden ourselves. I mean, one of the solutions that my twin brother has actually been talking about is there should, probably should be an IG in um, an inspector general on the NSC to report wrongdoing with kind of obligations to report up to Congress as a as a check on the executive branch. There wasn't which is one of the one of the reasons that this unfolded uh, as complexly as it did, uh, and you know, whistleblower had a, a felt like there was no other recourse to, than to go through, you know, intelligence community uh, inspector general channels to get to get to make sure that this didn't get swept under the rug. Um, the question as to why there were more weren't more of these, I, unfortunately, there are two two there are two uh, different branch possibilities. And one pre presents maybe about a rosy uh, uh, understanding that people were trying to preserve their position as guardrails and protect the institutions that they were charged with. You could live with something like that almost. If there's an enormous amount of hubris and, and some sort of failed understanding of the fact that there are countless people in position that could step in and do the job and uh, do it as well and continue to protect the, the, the institutions and pretend, continue to serve the nation. So that's the rosy one. The less rosy one is careerism and self-advancement and uh, not foreclosing on, on possibilities to cash in at some point. And I, I, my fear is that it's actually, those, those are the motivations rather than pr the protecting the institution ones. Because I'll tell you as I, you know, being now labeled a whistleblower, you know, an anti-Trumper or somebody that testified against the president, there are plenty of options that have been foreclosed for me. And those people that remain silent have access to all those options. And, and, and uh, they, in, in, a, in a cold calculation, some might suggest if they're purely most mercenary and self-serving, that it was the right thing to do. Uh, but that's not the way I, I live my life. That's not the way I see things. And uh, certainly it, it is not the way I behaved, uh, but that's, there's just a whole kind of uh, cohort that believe uh, that thinks that way. Yeah, there's a massive cohort that thinks that way. It's huge. Guys. It's just it really, truly is amazing that you can say on one hand the number of people who decided to step forward and say what they knew and know and do the right thing um, over the course of the four years. It's 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 ra rather astonishing. Um, I, I want to get to some of the consequences you said, but I I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the testimony um, first and. Um, you know, the, the most powerful part of the testimony for me was obviously the, the title of the book, uh, Here Right Matters, um, which was speaking to your father. And, and so tell people who don't know, your father was worried about you, both from the standpoint of uh, he was a supporter of the president uh, and from a standpoint, I think, of his experience, you know, in Russia and, and concerns about retaliation, et cetera. So, so just sort of talk about that and, and thinking about testi testifying and, and you know, recognizing you had to talk to the country, but you really had to talk to your dad too. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, that, that was a, a stroke of genius from my twin brother, uh, including that component, um, which, you know, it's, it's good that your, your, the little voice in your head is actually standing in front of you sometimes because, uh, you know, it, it's harder to ignore it. But as soon as he mentioned it, uh, you know, I put the words to paper and uh, wanted to put my dad's mind at ease. Um, I think, you know, early on, there was probably the thinking from my dad that, you know, 
Trump is the president of the United States and, you know, uh, the offer the office and being uh, a, a Trump voter, uh, he probably thought that the president was, you know, was potentially in the right. Uh, the more he learned about it, the more he dispelled, he, he dispelled that notion. And as soon as my mom basically forbade Fox News in the house and he started listening to other sources, uh, he was, he started to be deprogrammed. But um, I think if that was, that was a small portion of his concern. And, you know, I think in the book, I talk about the fact that my dad, you know, I had, had hoped early on before he understood the circumstances and why I spoke up that I would march in the president's office, you know, give him a sharp salute and say, uh, how do we work this out? <laughs> you know, how do we fix this? But, um, you know, he, there was no doubt in his mind that I did the right thing. And most of his concern, frankly, was based on the fact that he feared for my safety and that in his context, uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, you know, he was a, a small child when uh, um, Joseph Stalin uh, w was the leader. I mean, he actually was 11 when uh, Stalin passed away. So he didn't quite, didn't quite understand what was going on at, the, at that point in time, he was lionized. And, you know, this, this, is a, this goes into my bailiwick of Russia. So I could, I'm gonna take a 30 seconds to expound on this. But anyway, he's, uh, Stalin gets denounced by, by Khrushchev, the next leader. And then, you know, there's a, we learn about mass atrocities by, by Joseph Stalin, where, you know, thousands and thousands of people, I'm sorry, not thousands, millions of people were, were slaughtered. Uh, and people were put into concentration camps called gulags and stuff like that. <clears throat> so in his mind, uh, you know, that's the beginning of his kind of uh, his awareness of what could happen if you challenge the authoritarian. Uh, it got a little bit better, I guess, under Khrushchev and Brezhnev. And, and you know, um, those, that, that was my father's experience. You just went to an insane asylum if you challenged the, the, the autocrat, you know, and they doped you up with a whole bunch of stuff. So he was concerned about, you know, my, my uh, physical well, uh, well, well-being, the impact on my brother, my twin brother, who's, you know, still active duty, you know, serving right across the hall from me, and then the impact on family. And I think that's where, you know, uh, he wanted me to, to be uh, particularly cautious. And I was, in a lot of ways, just not going to be deterred from, from doing what I thought was right. And not, not, you know, basically taking half measures the way most people would feel com me comfortable taking, which is really how I ran afoul of the Department of Defense. They'd prefer I had kind of watered down my testimony, uh, be more, but have uh, been more, uh, less forthright and more reluctant or something of the na that nature. And, um, you know, um, I, I wasn't going, going to do that. I just the whole thing is just like a movie arc for me. It just gives me chills. I can think about the score in the background, and it's just your dad, forties in his forties, leaves Russia to leaves the Soviet Union to give you guys this opportunity. You 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 get to the height of power in America. Um, you have to make a decision to whether or not to do the right thing. Your father, who who is the reason why you got into that position, is is nervous because of that that past and that that history. And here you are having to say to him that you learn from him, you know, don't worry, dad, I'll be fine for telling the truth. I, I just, like, I just think that's just such a beautiful arc. And I just wonder like sitting here today, does he feel that way that you did fine by telling the truth? Do you feel that way? I, I do feel fine. And I think he, you know, he has, he, he, he we're all kind of uh, in certain ways, pretty idealistic, which adds to our resiliency and, he, he sees that I'm kind of la landed on my feet, not because anything kind of fell into my lap, but because I worked hard to make sure that my family, you know, could, could, I could still provide for my family. And I've invested a lot of time into to pursuing a doctorate and into, um, you know, some consulting uh, into working at a think tank. So he sees some of those things in the fact that uh, I, I'm recovered. Um, but he probably he doesn't quite understand that you know it's still extremely challenging i kind of haven't quite figured out exactly what i want to i know uh, my objectives uh, but i haven't quite figured out what my my second career is going to be or what i want to do i mean i i described a couple of things i'm in, i'm i'm invested in but i'm not sure if which one of those i want to do just yet so we're still trying to figure out kind of we're dealing with the fallout we're still trying to figure out what we want to do next uh and really uh enjoying exploring a bunch of different options and working hard to do that. You know, I had, I had uh, 
a, a conversation with um, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, promoting my book, which is pretty awesome and unique opportunity to talk to your like your 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 uh, hero, uh, who then somehow refers to you as a hero. It's a little surreal. Uh, and then kind of uh, you know, so there's been some pretty interesting things, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, there are many challenges to overcome. And uh, this is something that we miss about whistleblowers that the cost that they, they kind of uh, uh, incur for, for trying to do the right thing. Well, I'm, um, if, he's, if he's uncertain because of your not complete certainty, I'm happy to send him a video message letting him know that you are, you are indeed fine and will continue to be fine um, uh, while, you, while you work these things out um, with your family because there is, there is a real toll. I don't want to minimize that. But, but I mean, it's, uh, I, I think that your story demonstrates that, that, speaking, that, that people that spoke out ended up, uh, I think, feeling the best about themselves. And I think that they ended up, um, you know, I think in the long arc, um, obviously will be seen to have done the right thing. I think that's true of you and Olivia and, uh, and others. Um, uh, I've got, we've got some questions from the audience. Um, if you, if you want to ask a question, you can submit it in the YouTube text to chat. Um, I've got a couple more for, for Alex, but, I, but since this is on topic, I want to go uh, to this question um, that's asked, what went through your head once Trump was acquitted uh, by Senate Republicans? Um, did you know that you'd be removed from the White House that day? And, um, and what did it make you think about your decision to come forward? Well, I think uh, I, I had a, uh, I certainly didn't miss the fact that it was almost certain that the president would be acquitted by, um, by the Senate. There's never been a precedent in which, you know, the, the, uh, a party has voted against their president uh, in an impeachment uh, to, to remove him. So I, there was little doubt of that, doing that, of that happening. You know, I had my counsel, my um, legal counsel were uh, those, there, there are folks that are public and there, there are folks that are not, uh, they're, they're Republican stalwarts. I actually uh, selected a team of Republicans to kind of keep, provide me situational awareness by leveraging their access to the White House. They could pick up the phone and say, hey, uh, how are we doing? You know, like try to minimize the, the fallout for me it was a, a little bit of tactical maneuvering on my part. So there was, and they counseled me that there's no way that the president's going to be removed. But, and they wanted me to, they also wanted me to take some half measures, <clears throat> but that wasn't my job. My job was to provide factual testimony on what I'd witnessed and let the other folks decide and live with what the, uh, the you know, live with their decisions. Um, and that was that I, I tried to not overthink you know, uh, the, the entire arc of events and how this was going to play out. I was just trying to simply do my, my, my part, which was to, uh, to respond to a subpoena, to provide truthful testimony based on uh, what I witnessed, and then uh, leave it to senior folks uh, that are accountable to their constituencies to, to make the decision. And it didn't, and I absolutely, you know, I, this is a, that was a vindictive, uh, um, administration. So there was little doubt I was going to stay on in certain ways. I thought maybe after I, I'd offered my public testimony, I'd be fired. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the president was counseled to wait until after he was, uh, until after he was acquitted. And then he waited a couple of days. That was the surprising part is I thought, you know, he was acquitted on Wednesday. I'd be out by Thursday. I had already take, taken all my stuff out, but of course I missed one key fact that everybody knows firing day was Friday that's when firings happen so he was you know the dramatic firing day i waited until friday so yeah friday uh, evening even you know friday, the, friday after, yeah, friday after, cycle. yeah so um, this could be govern the airways for the next couple of days and to send a message to anybody else you have to make sure you you to deliver on firing day press before everything it is interesting isn't it that the president thought that it would ex increase his exposure to impeachment to fire you and so he just did it two days after he didn't have any exposure i think that's very telling about his his mindset I, I, for those who don't know i mean I, you have uh, I, I think taking this in much better cheer than a lot of other people would um i was and once again enraged on your behalf by the notion that that friday that there was i mean essentially a perp walk out of the White House um, of you and your brother, um, who, who did not testify, obviously, um, and was, was <laughs> decided to be guilty of association by association. Um, 
walk people through that and just uh, to me that was one of the most obviously it's a long list of unconscionable actions of the Trump administration but that was that was on my you know top 25 so there was there's frankly a sense of relief um, that only equated to maybe a couple of other instances in my life you know uh, leaving combat zone and you know landing on on safe ground in the US and then leaving uh, Russia after serving there as an attache in a fishbowl where you're constantly under surveillance and really quite beleaguered. I mean, frankly, that was even in certain ways more emotional coming back to the United States after serving in Russia for three years than, than being walked out of the White House. But they're similar. And I, there was an enormous sense of relief that I was leaving. Uh, and, you know, the line, I was out of the lines then, uh, you know, I had a little bit, um, at that time, I still had confidence or some confidence that, you know, the, the Army and the Department of Defense would, would look out for me and I'd still have a career. You have to recall that, you know, at this point from the, in the book, I mentioned the fact that I had already been selected for senior service college, which is a extremely high, uh, a tough kind of cut. Only 7%, 7.5% get selected for, for war college. And I was all but assured promotion to colonel. And I thought, you know, I could move on. I'd f- figure out what to do. Initially, there were discussions about doing some something pretty useful for the Department of Defense as a as a uh, as a uh, instructor and lecturer at the National Defense University, but I pretty pretty much quickly uh, you know uh, that those those uh, wishful uh, notions were dispelled when I was offered uh, uh, the the unique opportunity to be a my wife jokes a docent at the yet to be opened Army Museum in Fort Belvoir about as far away from the, from DC as possible and uh, you know basically at a, uh, keeping me as far away from the Pentagon as possible and the Capitol. Um, so, and I already had plenty of indications that uh, I was on very, very shaky ground, senior, very, very senior officials, three-star, you know, now, now one of them is now a four-star, kind of uh, said that I was basically, uh, that I was toast. Um, so, uh, but at the, on that day, I was, it was mainly a sense of relief. And what about having to have your brother there? I guess maybe that was, was that nice? Or you had, or were you upset that he got wrapped in? Well, definitely. I mean, he didn't, he didn't deserve it, but he also was uh, in, in the same vein as I was. He was investigating wrongdoing by uh, the National Security Advisor, O'Brien. And uh, it wasn't just the fact that he had the same face as me and the same last name, that, that was part of it. But he was also investigating wrongdoing by senior officials and it was convenient for them to kind of push them out in this in the same breath. Things that, frankly, haven't been addressed yet. Uh, this is one of the examples of, of you know accountability. Not uh, uh, we haven't actually had a full accounting of, of wrongdoing. So um, at the same time, we walked out of the building, your heads held high, and uh, knowing that we we had served honorably. Yeah. Um... Talk about, uh, I, want to, I want to get to some politics of the day and a couple other questions from the audience, but um, uh, talk about the retirement a- aspect of this, right? So, I, I mean, I, I had a, someone when uh, responded to me on Twitter about, about this event and said that they were mostly upset at the military, you know, for not kind of having your back in this regard. Um, there was a lengthy period to go over in the book of trying to, of weighing this notion about whether you should retire or not. Um, Talk about why you waited so long and, and just that agonizing notion of that experience. Well, I mean, I frankly wanted to, to compel the Army and the Department of Defense to do the right thing. That's why I waited until the, literally the very, very last day that I could do it without incurring what's called an additional duty service application. Because if once you, you, you receive, the Army gives you orders, you're, you execute those orders. And then sometimes in executing those orders, you incur more service obligation. So I did it. I dropped my retirement paper on the very, very last day I could do it without incurring uh, an additional service obligation that could have been as lengthy as three years. And um, in a lot of ways, the way things unfolded, uh, you know, justified my my actions. I'll, I'll I'll come around to that in a second. But I mean, all the data points I, I had collected from these these seniors telling me, one of them very kindly being super forthright, but something that I'm very grateful for, just telling me based on his understanding of the military that I probably wouldn't be able to continue to serve and that my prospects might be sunnier elsewhere. And then another one telling me that I had flown too close to the sun and uh, some people wouldn't take kindly to, you know, to, to my actions, just living up to, to, the, to my oath of office and, and staying true to my values. Uh, and, um, and I talk about those in, in the book. 
and then ultimately the, the military not living up to uh, to this pretense of protecting me. You know, there were some statements made about the fact that I'll, I'll be okay returning back to the military. There wouldn't be any investigations. There actually were inve there were investigations into into me based on false kind of statements uh, offered by the the White House. Um, and the, you know, the president, uh, actually the president's chief of staff, um, um, Meadows, Mark Meadows calling in the, the secretary of defense, the secretary of the army to denounce them for uh, p considering putting my name on a promotion list. You know how far down in the weeds that is? That's like, you know, it's just crazy stuff. And then ultimately, like I, point, I said earlier, dropped my paperwork on the last day, it was a Wednesday. Within two days, I had my retirement orders. People don't understand that how, how in, improbable that is in the military. It is a year long process. It takes six months to get your orders. They turn my orders in two days. And then on that, on that day, same day, they pre-positioned this list that had been held up for months at that point. It was supposed to be coming out in April. They didn't release it until July and they held it for months. And that same day that I, my uh, um, retirement was approved, they were happy to put that list forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, so everything really kind of justified that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to kind of, uh, continue to serve. And my twin brother, um, you know, it's his story to tell. I don't want to really go too far into it, but he's, he continues to suffer some of the same stigma associated with our, um, you know, proper actions, uh, to this day. That's insane to me that there's still a stigma. It's insane. I just I think that there's a black mark on the military. Uh, you can't at least get some solace knowing that Mark Meadows, who was coming after you and improperly trying to investigate you, is now holding uh, imaginary cabinet meetings at a gaudy nouveau riche golf club. Um, and so, you know, things have turned out all right for you by comparison. Um, I want to get into some rapid fire politics stuff. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, some of these questions for the audience, some are, you know, me uh, being curious uh, what your take is um, from, from the audience, a couple of them. Um, first, what, what is your thought about the treatment of the Capitol Police after January 6th? And, and how did your experience kind of inform what you saw happen that day? It's, it's atrocious. I feel a great deal of kinship with those folks because they're basically attacked by, uh, you know, um, uh, Trumpist uh, figures and uh, far-right media um, for just simply doing their, their jobs, holding the line, you know, in, in a critical moment for this, for this nation, uh, for our democracy. And I, I definitely feel a sense of kinship with them. I've tried to reach out and talk to those folks um, and give them some, uh, some, uh, some support, either as well as other folks deeper into uh, uh, Trump's retaliation on kind of good order and discipline. You know, folks that like that reported Eddie Gallagher, I've ma made a connection with one of the SEALs and maintain, you know, uh, um, contact with, with him just to, uh, to, to, exchange thoughts and, and uh, send support to each other. So it's, it's a horrible thing to do. It's interesting, just, just had this conversation with Schwarzenegger, and I, I know we're rapid fire, but he, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger was laser focused on unity. And I completely agree with that. And I would love for this country to come together to set aside our differences. But I think, frankly, we can't do that with open wounds and with uh, an absent accountability and shining a light on, you know, the big lie on the uh, COVID mismanagement that emerged out of the uh, the, the um, uh, House Republicans. Uh, I'm sorry, Senate Republicans failing to hold the president accountable. All these things need to be dealt with so like this we could come together as a country. That connects to our next rapid question from the audience. What do you think Trump will do if he would be elected in 2024? And do you think he is an aberration or a sign of the GOP to come? Um, I think that, um, I think it's, I don't think he's viable in 2024. I don't think he's viable in 2024 primarily because um, he continues to get smaller and smaller slivers of the pie. Um, and that's just not a, a winning strategy. But Trumpism is alive and well and prospering. And I think in a lot of ways, what you have is, um, you know, a, a further radicalization of a, a once honorable party, the grand old party. And um, until they break with, uh, with Trumpism, um, there are a lot of risks to our democracy. 
Totally agree. Okay, two quick foreign policy questions. I just I had to ask you reading this book. You're talking about the hearts and minds effort in Iraq. I, just looking back on that, like what like what was the failure there, and, I, and what are the lessons learned from that? And, and I just think that somebody coming from your background who understands the hearts and minds process really did work in Eastern Europe, um, as far as selling the American democratic ideal, not in Iraq. What 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 was the takeaway from that? I think part in part it was an application of resources. Uh, it was half measures and a lack of will of, uh, by the American people. And I think that in part justifies um, President Biden's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan is because he senses that we there was no uh, will to apply adequate resources to actually win the hearts and minds. It, it will take a lot more with regards to providing security for the population. It will take a lot more with regards to treasure uh, and potentially uh, blood uh, and lives lost. And uh, we, we didn't do that, obviously, in um, under the Bush uh, administration uh, with, with our amount of resources that were required in order to really kind of yield effects. Uh, so I think that's probably it. It's not that we, that sounds maybe there's an element of hubris in that, because I think there's still kind of a sense that American exceptionalism can do everything. We can't. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's really a resource issue uh, for, for those Okay, and uh, so Afghanistan. Then, just really quick, what is your sense of the of the withdrawal? Uh, I, I have very deeply mixed feelings about it because of the blood and treasure that I spent, and I, I keep asking myself why. And part of the answer uh, is because uh, the military leadership, not the military as an institution, but the military leadership, did not pro- provide the, the proper counsel, did not you know uh, provide the um, the best advice to achieve military and political objectives. And uh, I think understanding that we weren't going to achieve our military objective, military and political objectives, uh, we couldn't continue to pour resources there endlessly. Um, so I think the president ultimately is doing, doing the right thing, but there are things that need to be, there are, there are checks that have not, have not been cashed yet. And those include a check uh, to, to those that helped us those uh, interpreters that um, helped this country uh, and we need to help get those uh, people safe and secure. One last question from me and then we're going to go to a final from a special questioner. Um, uh, Rush, using your expertise, what can we expect next from Russia? Like what is the short middle, middle term expectation from Russia as far as aggression facing us and our and the bilateral relationship? Uh, it's been unchecked, and it's been unchecked mainly um, because uh, certainly in the past four years, the, the Trump administration, uh, even though a lot of the government was marching lockstep to apply sanctions and to implement a national security strategy for Russia, the signals from the chief executive were that Russia could act with impunity. Um, you know, we need to de- we needed to, along the way to deter Russia from putting boundaries on U.S. Uh, uh, troops. From cyber attacks, we didn't do that because the chief executive uh, uh, blocked a lot of those. Uh, so I think um, the biggest challenge in the short term is going to be reestablishing deterrence, indicating to the Russians that they can't act with impunity. But that is also going to increase the, the risks of uh, short term risks of confrontation because the Russians, there's a mismatch between their expectations of getting away with stuff and being held accountable. So we have to go through that that passage. And that's going to be a challenging that's going to be a challenge for the Biden administration. For sure. Um, well, the real star of the book um, is your wife, Rachel, uh, who's also a star on Twitter.com. I recommend folks follow her, Natsak Hobbyist. Um, uh, she uh, helped you gather your team for the, uh, uh, for the testimony. Um, she helped you with the, it sounds like the testimony itself, uh, steeled your family, I think, through a real tough time, a lot of threats that were coming in. Um, and so I wanted to ask her one question uh, based on the book that she thought that we should that I should ask you. And, and she points to a section about the engagement. And so in your engagement, you say in the book that you she was badgering you to to to, you know, kind of get on with it. And so you sort of rushed the engagement and didn't do the beautiful picturesque engagement that you'd hoped for. And she was wondering, uh, is it possible that there was that it was the fact that you were over eager to be engaged and it was not her fault? And given the fact that you have a top secret clearance, it's hard to believe that a little pressure from her was all it took for you to crack. So what I, do you say to that? Yes, dear. You're right. I was super, super eager to marry you. Uh, <laughs> but you can tell that story in your book. OK, this is my book. And that's the way their history is going to record it right now. So <laughs> encouragement for you to do yours. But, um, yeah, she's she was awesome. She, uh, um, you know, both my wife, and my daughter, 
my my twin brother um you know they were just uh they were rocks throughout this whole thing and um i'm very lucky to have them all so good uh, i'm so grateful for your service lieutenant colonel vinman uh, you are a blessing to our country i'm so happy that that your dad made that decision um, all those years ago. Um, and uh, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, I just want to th- say to everybody, our thanks to Alexander Vindman for joining us uh, and discussing that book, Here Right Matters, buy the book. It's wonderful. Um, there's much more we didn't get into during this conversation. I'd like to thank the audience uh, for watching and for sending in the questions. Um, and if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts in making virtual, hey, virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Um, To Miller, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Go Tigers. We'll see you all soon. Thanks, Tim. It was wonderful.